murders that were committed simply to assert themselves as gang leaders. There was no other reason for it. When they tried to model themselves on the Mafia, they saw themselves as, as Mafia-type gang leaders. Just as we were about to close the investigation down, a man called Hugh McCowan, who was in fact a baronet, went into a, a police station in Maribyrn and said that he wanted to uh, talk about the craze. Well, it was well known that I was conducting this investigation, and so this guy was sent over to me. Uh, he was a very well-educated man. He was running a club in the West End of London, and the story that he, he, that he told was that uh, the twins through a man called Teddy Smith were trying, was, were trying to exhort money from him, uh, a, a typical protection money uh, racket. Uh, he gave a long statement and also his manager did too and we found in fact that his manager was, was the person that uh, gave the more substantive evidence and so based on that we decided to make the arrests. The manager who of course was the man that gave the real meaty evidence, uh, had already been tainted. His, his story to me was that, that uh, he had been walking around London and suddenly he'd had a revelation from God that uh, he shouldn't tell this story, that it was a story that was false, and that suddenly when he came to his senses he realised that he was in Valence Road and he walked into a 178, which was the home of the craze then, and there demanded to see a priest, and so one was brought to him, and then he confessed that the story that he'd given before was false, and that he now wanted to renege on that and give the true evidence. Mr. Cray. You haven't got the bottle. eventually traced most of the witnesses there, but uh, none of them would, would give evidence that they'd seen Ronnie Craig. They were immovable because there was always this wall of silence. First of all, this natural wall of silence that people in the East End don't talk to the coppers. And the second thing was that this wall of fear. The story of the craze has several victims, none sadder than Francis. Amidst the glamour, she had become increasingly disillusioned with her life and found it impossible to escape the notoriety of her husband or compete with the intensity of his relationship with his twin brother. In June 1967, Frances killed herself with an overdose of tablets. 
Reggie insisted that she be buried in her wedding dress. It really slaughtered him. And, um, well, for a week or two, he just didn't know what he was doing. He was just wandering the days. And uh, when she died, he gave up. He had a death wish, I'm sure, uh, in many ways. Cornell's killing escalated a long-standing feud with the Richardsons, a rival gang from south of the river. To support them in this campaign, the firm wanted Frank Mitchell, the mad axeman. In 1967, they arranged his escape from Dartmoor Prison. A massive search ensued. He was hiding here, in a flat in the east end of London, looked after by Albert Donoghue, a trusted member of the firm. Soon afterwards, the Richardsons were imprisoned, before the showdown could take place. Mitchell was still a wanted man, but not by the craze. If the twins got him out, and the twins are looking after him, nobody can kill him in, in front of the twins. There's only one people who can hurt him, and that's the twins himself. I don't know, the only thing I'll put it down to, he got too much trouble. He was a great big massive guy. I can assure you that he'd chew and eat them two, plus aren't the firm for breakfast and think nothing of it. He's a great big massive guy, strong as a lion. Maybe he got out of line, they couldn't handle it, <clears throat> they couldn't handle him, they didn't know what to do, and the only thing they knew how is get rid of him. Couldn't put him back in prison, they couldn't just, because they would be letting themselves down in front of the firm, but grassing him up, they can't say, come and get Mitchell, he's here. That's grassing. Them days it was never ever heard of. Nobody grasped in the underworld them days. Frank Mitchell's body was never found. Officially, his murder remains unsolved. Reggie's only escape was into the company of his brother. But by now, Ronnie's behavior offered little sanctuary. He now saw murder as a demonstration of allegiance to the firm. Reggie had yet to prove his. McVitie was... Uh two pound a week bandit. He was not, uh, he was not a villain of, of their caliber by any means. So he posed no threat to them. So any suggestion that he was killed in retaliation for threats that, uh, that he'd offered them is just nonsense. Uh, but the story that was circulated was that this was a, a crime that was really motiveless. The only motive that could be ascribed to it was that Ronald Cray had said, having killed Cornell, well, I've done my one, Reggie. Now you do yours. Uh, he thought that he'd been invited with the rest of them to a, uh, a drink up to a party. You can imagine his surprise when Reggie Cray suddenly appeared and offered a gun to his head and pulled the trigger. Ron! Ronnie was always winding him up. I've done more and you go and do yours. And he, he more or less wound him up that day. Got him really, truly at it, and he got him in the front. I don't think, I don't think uh, Reggie would have done it, but he, Ronnie wound him up. Put a man a man. No way. I mean, I knew Jack very, very well. Jack is a very, very good pal of mine. Whatever he'd done or whatever he was, he didn't warrant that. You left us no choice, Jack! <laughs> he tried to get out of the window, but he was dragged back by the people there. And then he was held by Ronnie Cray, and by this time, Reggie had been given a kitchen knife, one of those long, serrated kitchen knives. He hit McVitie, first of all, on the jaw, and then he stabbed him a number of times, until eventually the poor man fell to the floor when he pushed the knife through his throat and twisted it and pulled it out again. Well, of course, it didn't take long for McVitie to die. Contrary to Ronnie's deranged beliefs, McVitie's killing did not prove to be an act of allegiance. Quite the opposite. The gratuitous nature of their actions had begun to alarm members of the firm. The wall of silence was beginning to crumble. The police campaign gathered momentum, but Nipper Reed was insistent that the investigation gather substantive evidence against the twins before any attempt was made to charge them with murder. The, uh, first of all started out looking at again the frauds and these really formed the basis of the investigation and so we went on from there to investigate any other kind of crime with the exception of murder and this was a, 
a very positive decision that I made because I felt that if we started to investigate murders, then the question of the, of the witness's safety might be jeopardised. It was almost common knowledge that Ronnie Cray had shot George Cornell in The Blind Beggars. Uh, as a matter of fact, when uh, later I started to investigate it, people in the East End said to me that the Crays did everything but take the front page of the Times to advertise the fact. I mean, this enhanced their position as gang leaders, you see. They must have felt such immense power. You see, when they'd done their first killing with Cornell, it must have been about a year or two years before they nicked them. So it must have given them a very high sense of power, the, the untouchables. No one was safe. No one. In 1965, the craze had seemed invulnerable to prosecution. Three years later, a trail of senseless killings destroyed that position. Leslie Payne was a fraudster. He didn't need violence because he could charm people, he could persuade people. And so when he realized that there was no measure by which he could control the violence of the craze, he decided then that that was too much for him and he walked away. And so when I saw him, I was able to persuade him that, that uh, it would be important and beneficial to him because I could offer him protection to make a statement outlining all of the craze activities and this he did uh, he didn't unfortunately for me know anything about the murders because by that time he'd long since left them but he did tell me about the frauds about the long firm frauds and certain other activities that the craze had been involved in he told me in no uncertain terms that the craze had threatened his life and so as far as he was concerned then it was in his own interest to see them put away and, and hopefully for a long time. On the 8th of May 1968, Nipper Reed coordinated a massive police swoop to arrest the craze and over 70 members of the firm. It was the start of an operation that would rewrite British legal history. It was all timed for six o'clock in the morning. They were all provided with arrest sheets and descriptions of the people that they had to arrest and so on. And of course these were all over the place, they were all over the East End and, and all over other, other places in London, of course. And so off we went, and I went with uh, my then deputy, Frank Cater, um, and, and some other officers, and we went to uh, Braithwaite House, which was where the craze were then living. And there we found Ronnie and Reggie in bed, and they were both arrested and taken back to West End Central Police Station. In fact, we were the first team back of all, all the teams that had been sent out that night. We probably got the easiest operation, I suppose. Now that the craze was safely inside, work on the case could begin in earnest. There was still no evidence or testimony that would convict either twin of murder. What I wanted to do in this operation was not make the mistake that I did in the 1964-65 one. And that was that I thought once the craze themselves had been arrested, people who'd been victims of their uh, activities would come into the station and say, I want to give evidence. They never did that. And so I learned then that there was this wall of silence in the East End that was almost insurmountable. Once they were all inside, it had been generated from uh, the cells of the craze and others that now they were all together, they got to stick together. And that uh, if anybody uh, was found uh, to, to be uh, attempting to give evidence for the prosecution, then certain uh, repercussions would occur and their wives and family would be in danger. The twins could no longer intimidate. They had become too volatile and too violent. Albert Donoghue, who was one of the senior lieutenants, uh, one of the, the big hefty men, uh, his mother came to see me. He'd been arrested and charged. And his mother came to see me at Bow Street Court and said he wanted to see me in prison. One of the problems is, of course, that if you've got a conspiracy like that where a number of people are together when they commit an act, unless one of them is willing to give evidence of the prosecution, then you can't mount a successful uh, prosecution. And so this was the situation as far as they were concerned. We needed one of this group to come forward. We knew basically what had happened, that this had happened in the basement of this house in Evering Road, but it was a question of getting witnesses. There was one man missing, a man called Ronnie Hart. Uh, he was a relation, or it suggested that he was a relation of, of the craze, a cousin. Uh, and he'd never been arrested in the first sweep because we'd no evidence against him. We managed to trace him and uh, 
he, eventually he, he was persuaded to make a statement in which he said exactly what happened and he was the prime witness against the, the crazy. One piece was still missing, Cornell. A key witness to the murder had been a barmaid from the Blind Beggar pub. She was terrified of the craze and steadfastly refused to testify against them. She had seen who had, ki had killed Cornell. She knew him, she actually knew Ronald Craig. And so uh, we began to give her as much comfort uh, and assistance as we could at that time. But we weren't getting anywhere because at that time people didn't believe that the Crays were going to be held in custody and successfully prosecuted. They believed, as they'd always believed, that they would walk on water again, that they would, that they would be able to be acquitted and come back to, to their usual uh, uh, habits in the, in the east end of London. Given a new identity, the barmaid was moved out of London to a secret address in Essex. Eventually, she was uh, persuaded by the, the, the nature of the support that she had that she could tell the truth. And in fact, later on in court, she very dramatically pointed to Ronnie Cray and said that is the man uh, that she'd seen in the Blind Beggar's public house. The trial started in January 1969. It was to become the longest and most expensive trial in British legal history, with more people in the dock accused of murder than there had ever been before. On the 5th of March 1969, both Ronnie and Reggie Cray were found guilty of the charges brought against them. It wasn't a surprise at all I expected. They said they would get 30 years. They told the barrister, they told the screws in prison in Brixton they would get 30 years, and they did. I was absolutely overwhelmed. I, I realized that uh, if somebody had said something to me, I couldn't answer because I was, I was full with emotion. Because this was now a, a situation that had been going on so long. You know, my, my whole reputation, my life depended on this almost. It was a, a fulfillment of uh, an enormous undertaking by my squad. And, and uh, you know, I felt... Uh, justified that they'd done all the work that uh, was necessary of them and that we'd achieve something, really achieve something. Aunt Violet, myself and Mum, was in the kitchen and we was listening to the wireless and when it came on that um, they got 30 years, you know, we was, we was dumbstruck, really. We couldn't believe it, like, and Aunt Violet looked at Mother and she said, oh, I think they've made a mistake. She said, I'm sure they have. She said, maybe they, they'll say later, like, it's not so long. I'm not going to waste words on you. In my view, society has earned a rest from your activities and I recommend that you be held for at least 30 years. I feel they were a part of the 60s like the minicar and, and Twiggy and other things. You know, they, they were a part of it.